God, thank you that that you've given a most precious message to us, and uh, as we're looking upon something that um, helps us better understand why we deal with the difficult things we deal with in this world today, I pray that you'd speak to us and that you would bless us and that you would give us clarity on the chronology and the motives behind what has led to what we have now. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I've been asked to speak on the topic of before time begins, sin and war in heaven. Uh, so I just want to kind of go back in time, if you will. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16, it says that he who does not love does not know God. Why is that? Because God is love. And we have known, verse 16, known and believed the love that God has for us. And again, it says that God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now, if God is love, then one of the best places to find definitions of how he does life is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which has a nickname. That nickname is the the love chapter. And so I've taken a little creative license. Hopefully this isn't heretical. Um, But if the Bible says that God is love, these can be interchangeable. And so I put in brackets uh, personalizing 1 Corinthians 13 as an explanation or a biography of God, his own character attributes. So it says that God suffers long and is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. He's not puffed up. He does not behave rudely. He does not seek his own. He always lives in an other-centered frame of mind. Is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. He bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This is the way that God does life, and this is the way that things began. So God is love, and the very fact that love focuses on others implies that there have to be others to love, right? God did not exist by himself, God the Father, in isolation. There was already some form of familial environment from eternity past. Uh, This is one of the many allusions in Scripture to the plurality of God, but that's not what this message is about. So seeing that, we see in John chapter 1 and verse 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. God. He was present with God, and the Word was God, the same nature, and was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, the Spirit of Prophecy gives us some more information on this eternal relationship that Christ and the Father had before time began, and I want to walk through some of that, uh, because unfortunately that's becoming a point of contention amongst folks yet again. So this is from the Review and Herald, April 5, 1906. And a lot of these quotes are going to be on the board. Uh, So for my friend here in the front who's helping us, uh, many things will be on the board. And you can just read the quotes because I have this horrible speech impediment. It's called um, not being able to slow down. That's that's not a clinical term, but it's uh, that's that's just a, a fault. So it says this, before men or angels were created, the word was with God and was God, quoting John 1. The world was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And listen to this. If Christ made all things, he existed before all things. The words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one need be left in doubt. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. He was with God from how long? From all eternity. God over all blessed forevermore. And this is from Signs of the Times, August 29, 1900. In speaking of his preexistence, and they were quoting, she was pro- quoting Proverbs 8 uh, in the pr- paragraph before this, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that there was never a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. He has been with God as one brought up with him. But a time came when the Father and the Son decided to expand that family and the Spirit and the angelic beings were created. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34. The Father wrought by his Son in the creation of all heavenly beings. By him were all things created, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Continuing this thought from Signs of the Times, 1898. When the Lord created these angelic beings to stand before his throne, they were beautiful and glorious. Their loveliness and holiness were equal to their exalted station. They were enriched by the wisdom of God and girded with the panoply of heaven. 
And one of these that was created was Lucifer. And I saw a statement last night when researching I've never seen before and kind of shook me a little bit. This is Review and Herald, September 24, 1901. God made him, Lucifer, good and beautiful, as near as possible like himself. Yo, that's incredible, isn't it? All right, continuing on, Sabbath School Worker, March 1, 1893. God had made him, Lucifer, noble, had given him rich endowments. He gave him a high, responsible position. He asked of him nothing that was unreasonable. And this is such an important point because what eventually happens later is this idea that God is arbitrary, that his commands are ridiculous and restrictive. But God asked nothing of him that was unreasonable, we're told. He was to administer the trust given him of God in a spirit of meekness and devotion, seeking to promote the glory of God who had given him glory and beauty and loveliness. This is from 4SP 317. Though God had created Lucifer noble and beautiful and had exalted him to high honor among the angelic host, yet he had not placed him beyond the possibility of evil. It was in Satan's power, she uses his names interchangeably as far as the chronology of Lucifer's experience. He was created Lucifer, became Satan. She will use those interchangeably, so these are not necessarily chronological statements, just to make that clear. But it was in Satan's power, and did he choose to do so to pervert these gifts? Right, Because the Bible says that God is love, and for love to be meaningful, there has to be freedom to choose. And this is one of those things that can happen. That possibility was there. It's from the story of redemption. Lucifer in heaven, before his rebellion, was a high and exalted angel, next in honor to God's dear son. His countenance, like those of the other angels, was mild and expressive of happiness. His forehead was high and broad, showing a powerful intellect. His form was perfect, his bearing noble and majestic. A special light beamed in his countenance and shone around him brighter and more beautiful than around the other angels. Yet Christ, God's dear Son, had the preeminence over all the angelic hosts. He was one with the Father before the angels were created. So Lucifer was created in a very impressive way and was quite a majestic being. But he had, as all the angels had, that ability to use his attributes in a selfish manner if he so chose. But for a time, he didn't make that choice. We see this in the spirit of prophecy. Peace and joy in perfect submission to the will of heaven existed throughout the angelic host. Love to God was supreme, love for one another impartial. Such was the condition that existed for ages before the entrance of sin. Signs of the Times. He, Lucifer, had a knowledge of the inestimable value of eternal riches that man did not possess. He had experienced the pure contentment, the peace, the exalted happiness and unalloyed joys of the heavenly abode. He had realized before his rebellion the satisfaction of the full approval of God. He had a full appreciation of the glory that enshrouded the Father and knew that there was no limit to his power. He basked in the glory of God's awesomeness before his fall and enjoyed it. There was a time when Satan was in harmony with God. This is Signs of the Times. And it was his joy to execute the divine commands. His heart was filled with love and joy in serving his creator until he began to think that his wisdom was not derived from God but was inherent in himself and that he was as worthy as was God to receive honor and power. Do we face that same danger today? People in ministry, people doing the Lord's work, doing powerful things in the name of the Lord, and we can forget, right? We don't continue in abdicating our throne. We jump on the throne and say, is this not great Babylon, which I have built, right? And our own spiritual experiences. Signs of the times. The angels had been created full of goodness and love. They loved one another impartially and their God supremely, and they were prompted by this love to do his pleasure. They weren't coerced. They weren't forced, right? They weren't threatened. The law of God was not a grievous yoke to them, but it was their delight to do his commandments, to hearken under the voice of his word. But in this state of peace and purity, 
Sin originated with him who had been perfect in all his ways. And there's dissonance there, isn't there? How can this be the case? Well, this is exactly how God feels. How can this be the case? Continuing this quote, The prophet writes of him, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Sin is a mysterious, unexplainable thing. There was no reason for its existence, and to seek to explain it is to seek to give a reason for it, and that would be to justify it. Sin appeared in a perfect universe, a thing that was shown to be inexcusable. Patriarchs and Prophets, little by little, Lucifer came to indulge the desire for self-exaltation. Though all his glory was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. Back to the spirit of prophecy. The great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son. So when this process begins... And there's a rumbling in the camp, and God sees what's happening. It is now that God makes a firm and fast declaration of the preeminence of Jesus. And this really bothers Lucifer, because he's being challenged here. The Son was seated on the throne with the Father, and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The Father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his Son, should be equal with himself. So that wherever was the presence of his son, it was as his own presence. She continues, The word of the son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the father. His son he had invested with authority to command the heavenly host. That's why he's called the chief of the angels, or the archangel, the chief over the angels. Especially was his son to work in union with himself in the anticipated creation of the earth. So we get some glimpse into the kind of chronology, and this is hard. You got to take your shoes off for this topic because this is, we don't have clear delineated timelines, but it seems to me that this process begins, this kind of disruption begins soon before the creation of the earth. Satan was envious and jealous of Christ, spirit of prophecy again. Yet when all the angels bowed to Jesus to acknowledge his supremacy and high authority and rightful rule, Satan bowed with them. But his heart was filled with envy and hatred. So he's still offering some form of obedience, but his heart is no longer in it. And can that happen to us? There's a lot of warnings for us today. This is not just a history of something from time past. This is what our fall looks like. We find ourselves still in the Christian experience, doing the thing that God wants, but our heart isn't quite in it as it used to be. And the charge of warning that was given to the church at Ephesus and implied to the church at Laodicea was, you have lost your first love. But it says, I've seen your deeds. So you're still doing religious deeds, but no longer out of unselfish love and gratitude. You're just going through the motions. You understand the difference? And this is what's implied here. What happened to him is exactly what happens to us. And this is a a very solemn warning to us. So... Christ had been taken in a special council of God in regard to his plans. The council of peace is something that's alluded to for this. While Satan was unacquainted with them, he did not understand neither why he was not permitted to know, or neither was he permitted to know the purposes of God. But Christ was acknowledged sovereign of heaven, his power and authority to be the same as that of God himself. Continuing this quote, Satan thought that he himself, he was himself a favorite in heaven among the angels. He had been highly exalted, but he aspired to the height of God himself. He gloried in his loftiness. He knew that he was honored by the angels. He had a special mission to execute. He had been near the great creator, and the ceaseless beams of glorious light enshrouding the internal God had shone especially upon him. That cherub who covers, it says in Psalm 18, verse 1, you who dwell between the cherubim shine forth. Right? This is someone who's in the immediate presence of God, and this is drawn out in a later text we'll come up to. Satan thought how angels had obeyed his command with pleasurable alacrity, and there were, were not his garments light and beautiful? Why should Christ thus be honored before himself? Review and Herald. Satan had been ambitious for the more exalted honors which God had bestowed upon his son. He became envious of Christ and represented to the angels who honored him as covering cherub that he had not the honor conferred upon him, which his position demanded. 
the educational messenger, by sly insinuations by which he made it appear that Christ had assumed the place that belonged to himself, Lucifer sowed the seeds of doubt in the minds of many of the angels, painting a picture that Jesus usurped the position that he himself was supposed to receive. This is from This Day with God. Lucifer's work of deception was done in so great secrecy that the angels in less exalted positions supposed that he was the ruler of heaven. The spirit of prophecy. Angels that were loyal and true sought to reconcile this mighty, rebellious angel to the will of his creator. They justified the acting of God in conferring honor upon Jesus Christ, and with forcible reasoning sought to convince Satan that no less honor was his now than before the Father had proclaimed the honor which he had conferred upon his Son. Continuing, they clearly set forth that Jesus was the Son of God, existing with them before the angels were created, and that he had ever stood at the right hand of God. And his mild, loving authority had not heretofore been questioned. This is the amazing thing of how the Godhead did life. There was so much other-centered love going on that no one really knew who was in charge, per se. Because no one was demanding or clamoring for worship or allegiance. Love was freely given. Deference was freely given. Because that's how it operated there. Isn't that amazing? That's the only reason why angels could have been convinced that maybe Lucifer was the supreme of heaven was because no one else was clamoring for it. No one was clawing at others, trying to climb the corporate ladder here. He had ever stood at the right hand of God, and his mild loving authority had not heretofore been questioned, and that he was given no commands, but it was joy for the heavenly host to execute. They urged that Christ receiving special honor from the Father in the presence of the angels did not detract from the honor that he, Satan, had heretofore received. Why are you threatened by God loving and favoring someone when God loves and favors you too? Why are you threatened by that? Patriarchs and prophets, the very first effort of Satan to overthrow God's law undertaken among the sinless inhabitants of heaven seemed for a time to be crowned with success. A vast number of the angels were seduced. We'll get a percentage here in a moment. Review and Herald. God's government included not only the inhabitants of heaven, but of all the created worlds. And Satan thought that if he could carry the intelligences of heaven with him in rebellion, he could also carry with him the other worlds. He's not content even if he won over just the angels. Another quote from Review and Herald, a different date. That which Satan had instilled into the mind of the angels, a word here and a word there. And by the way, this is, if you see the fall of Absalom and the way in which he was wheeling and dealing, that's a type of Lucifer, right? Drawing the affections away. Oh, that the king, you know, had time for you. He doesn't really care about you, but I do, right? He's a type of Lucifer in that sense. We see that happening here. Open the way for a long list of suppositions. In his artful way, he drew expressions of doubt from them. Then when he was interviewed, listen to this, he accused those whom he had educated. He laid all the disaffection on the ones he had led. He's kind of gaslighting here. He's projecting blame. Oh, no, that wasn't my idea. It was their idea. But who gave them that idea, right? How does this develop in an environment where selfishness has never existed? This is a mystery, beloved. A grand, unexplainable mystery. The sophistication of sin in its infancy should scare you. It should shock you. The sophistication of sin even in its infancy. This is Christ's object lessons. Even the loyal angels did not fully discern Satan's character. And this is why God did not at once destroy Satan. Had he done so, the holy angels would not have perceived the justice and love of God. They would have served him out of fear. Don't make dad mad or you'll get in trouble, right? Don't, don't stir the pot. A doubt of God's goodness would have been as evil seed that would yield the bitter fruit of sin and woe. Therefore, the author of evil was spared fully to develop his character. Back to the spirit of prophecy. Satan refused to listen. And he turned from the loyal and true angels, denouncing them as slaves. These angels, true to God, stood in amazement as they saw that Satan was successful in his efforts to excite rebellion. 
He promised them a new and better government than they then had, in which all would be freedom. But here's the problem. You already had freedom. And what you're really offering is not freedom, but bondage. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You can't be an antinomian. You know that, right? You're going to follow one law one way or the other. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus or the law of sin and death. It is so pervasive and overpowering, the Bible equates sin to a law. Great numbers signified their purpose to accept Satan as their leader and chief commander. And she continues, as he saw his advances were met with success, he flattered himself that he should have yet all the angels on his side and that he would be equal with God himself. And his voice of authority would be heard in commanding the entire host of heaven. Continuing, again, the loyal angels warned Satan and assured him what must be the consequences if he persisted that he who could create the angels could by his power overturn all their authority in terrible rebellion. To think that an angel should resist the law of God, which was as sacred as God himself. They warned the rebellious to close their ears to Satan's deceptive reasonings and advised Satan and all who had been affected by him to go to God, confess their wrong for even admitting a thought of questioning his authority. The Review and Herald. Satan was artful in presenting his side of the question. And as soon as he found that one position was seen in its true character, he changed it for another. Not so with God. He could work only with one class of weapons, truth and righteousness. Satan could use what God could not, crookedness and deceit. The SDA Bible Commentary. The underworking of Satan was so subtle that it could not be made to appear before the heavenly host as the thing that it really was. And this condition of things had existed a long period of time before Satan was unmasked. This was not a one-day affair, beloved. This was an ordeal that stretched out over time. It's from the great controversy. God in his great mercy bore long with Lucifer. Can we say amen to that? If God can bear long with him, you better believe he's bearing long with you. He was not immediately degraded from his exalted station when he first indulged the spirit of discontent, not even when he began to present his false claims before the loyal angels. Long was he retained in heaven. There's multiple terms used here that imply this was a a span of time. Again and again, he was offered pardon on condition of repentance and submission. He could have come back. He could have changed course. God was willing to give him that. Patriarchs and prophets. The spirit of discontent and disaffection had never before been known in heaven. It was a new element, strange, mysterious, and unaccountable. Lucifer himself had not at first been acquainted with the real nature of his feelings. He didn't fully grasp what was going on initially. And for a time, he had feared to express the workings and imaginings of his mind. Yet he did not dismiss them. And that's where you and I can get in trouble, right? I think Spurgeon phrased it this way, that you can't stop the birds from flying overhead, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair, right? You got to nip that thing in the bud. He did not dismiss them. He did not see whither he was drifting, continuing in Patriarchs and Prophets. But such efforts as infinite love and wisdom only could devise were made to convince him of his error. His disaffection was proved to be without cause, and he was made to see what would be the result of persisting in revolt. He was convicted. He saw that he was wrong. And again, there's lessons here for us. What do you do when you're convicted? Do you harden yourself? Do you become more grizzled? Or do you give in and respond to the pleading grace of God? Because God didn't do this to kick the guy out. God did this to try to keep him. Are you understanding? This is so important that when you're convicted, that is not God saying, I don't like you. That is God's appeal of love saying, I don't want to lose you. Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. He saw that the divine statutes are just and that he ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. That's a corporate repentance, right? Individually, the the thing he's building right here, he's going to have to proclaim this publicly because he started the problem publicly. 
and he wouldn't do it. He didn't want to eat crow. He didn't want to take responsibility. Had he done this, he might have saved himself and many angels. He had not at that time fully cast off his allegiance to God. This is an important point. He hadn't fully left, but he was struggling with the things he was feeling and thinking. Though he had left his position as covering cherub, yet if he had been willing to return to God, acknowledging the Creator's wisdom and satisfied to fill the place appointed him in God's great plan, he would have been reinstated in his office. The time had come for a final decision. He must fully yield to the divine sovereignty or place himself in open rebellion. And he nearly reached the decision to return. But what happened? Pride forbade him. Guys, that's us. I hope you're seeing yourself in the mirror today. This is us. The reason why we don't find healing and reconciliation and restoration is not because God's hand is not stretched out still. It's pride. It's pride. Spirit of prophecy. The loyal angels hasten speedily to the Son of God and acquaint him with what's taking place among the angels. They find the Father in conference with his beloved Son to determine the means by which for the best good of the loyal angels, they assumed authority of Satan could be forever put down. The great God could at once have hurled this arch deceiver from heaven, but this was not his purpose. He would give the rebellious an equal chance to measure strength and might with his own son and his loyal angels. There's a challenge that's been issued here. In this battle, every angel would choose his own side and be manifested to all. Continuing. Many of Satan's sympathizers were inclined to heed the counsel of the loyal angels and repent of their dissatisfaction and be again received to the confidence of the Father and his dear Son. The mighty revolter then declared that he was acquainted with God's law and if he should submit to servile obedience, his honor would be taken from him. No more would he be entrusted with his exalted mission. But that's not true. He could have been restored to the same position. He told them, he told them that himself and they also had now gone too far to go back. How many believers are doing that to themselves right now? Believing the lie of Satan that I have gone too far to go back, so I might as well keep it moving. Where do you think those thoughts come from? For to bow and servile were uh, too far to go back, and he would brave the consequences. I would rather face the consequences than face the fact that I have been wrong. For to bow in servile worship to the Son of God, he never would. That God would not forgive, and now they must assert their liberty and gain by force the position and authority which was not willingly accorded them. Continuing in the spirit of prophecy. All the heavenly hosts were summoned to appear before the Father to have each case determined. There's a judgment coming, right? There's an investigation before a judgment is rendered. That's the way that God has always done business. It even started there. He investigates before he renders a judgment. Satan unblushingly made known his dissatisfaction that Christ should be preferred before him. He stood up proudly and urged that he should be equal with God and should be taken into conference with the Father and understand his purposes. Now, I've struggled to find the references for this, and uh, I couldn't cheat and ask Fred, unfortunately. But I, there, there is an illusion in the spirit of prophecy that this council of peace took place that the Father and the Son met together to discuss their provision should a fall take place. And this is what made him so angry that he wasn't invited into that meeting. And that's the irony of this. The whole rebellion starts over what to do if there's a rebellion and how to make grand provision. But I've struggled to find the reference for that. He stood up proudly and urged that he should be equal with God and should be taken into conference with the Father and understand his purposes. Continuing spirit of prophecy, God informed Satan that to his son alone he would reveal his secret purposes, and he required all the family in heaven, even Satan, to yield him implicit, unquestioned obedience, but that he had proved himself unworthy a place in heaven. Then Satan exultingly pointed to his sympathizers, comprising nearly one half of all the angels, and exclaimed, these are with me. Will you expel these also and make such a void in heaven? You need us. He then declared that he was prepared to resist the authority of Christ and to defend his place in heaven by force and might, strength against strength. Patriarchs and prophets. So far as Satan himself was concerned, it was true that he had now gone too far to return. 
but not so with those who had been blinded by his deceptions. And this is why eventually that number is cut down to a third, right? Some people eventually change course. To them, the counsel and entreaties of the loyal angels opened a door of hope, and had they heeded the warning, they might have broken away from the snare of Satan. But again, pride, love for their leader, and the desire for unrestricted freedom were permitted to bear sway. But guys, this is the delusion of sin. It makes you fight hoof and claw for something that literally is already yours. True freedom. You're selling your soul for something that's already yours. But pride, love for their leader, and the desire for unrestricted freedom were permitted to bear sway, and the pleadings of divine love and mercy were finally rejected. The great controversy. To the very close of the controversy in heaven, the great usurper continued to justify himself. When it was announced that with all his sympathizers he must be expelled from the abodes of bliss, then the rebel leader boldly avowed his contempt for the Creator's law. He reiterated his claim that angels needed no control, but should be left to follow their own will, which would ever guide them right. Had that work out for you? He denounced the divine statutes as a restriction of their liberty and declared that it was his purpose to secure the abolition of law that freed from his this restraint, the host of heaven might enter upon a more exalted, more glorious state of existence. Hey, he used that line not too long after this, didn't he? In the book of Genesis. I won't steal somebody's thunder, though. I think that's Brian. With one accord, Satan and his hosts threw the blame of the rebellion wholly upon Christ, declaring that if they had not been reproved, they would never have rebelled. Revisionist history, right? That's what sin does. The Review and Herald, February 24, 1874. The knowledge which Satan, as well as the angels who fell with them, had of the character of God, of his goodness, his mercy, wisdom, and excellent glory, made their guilt unpardonable. You know better. They knew better, and that's what made it such a grievous violation. So that's the spirit of prophecy giving some of the backdrop to the familiar text we're going to read now. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Now, the word war here is the word polemos, which is the root word we get for politics and polemics, right? Politics is where grown men act like children, and now women, unfortunately. Men and women act like children, arguing with each other over things that are just ridiculous, right? Arguing, debating, the art of polemics, arguing. Right? So the root word that's used here is indicative of this. That's not to say there wasn't a physical removal of them, but what's primarily highlighted in the original language here is it was a war of words and ideas. And uh, we'll see something else in a later text. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, yeah, this just this, this isn't pretty. Then we get to Ezekiel chapter 28, and it's very interesting. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but the language that's used of Lucifer, the selfish, self-focused language that's used of him and about him in Ezekiel 28 uh, beginning before the verses we normally use, we're going to start in verse 1 and going further into verse 14, I think is where it's at. And then in Isaiah 14, in those verses is very self-focused, self-elevating language. And that's the same exact language that's used about the little horn power in prophecy. That very system of selfishness, of self-exaltation, of questioning the true character of God's love and teaching others to live for me. This whole process that he started there is the storefront, is the church that he eventually starts on this earth and that is so relevant in Bible prophecy. But it's the same language, same exact language when you compare them. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to have to skip some of this, I think, for time's sake, but we'll see how far I can get. Uh, that doesn't look very promising. So yeah, we'll have to skip some stuff. But just read through that. It's really helpful. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm going to go to verse... I'll just highlight the stuff that's really selfish. So in verse 2, you, you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God because your heart was lifted up before that. Yet you are a man and not God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. 
Verse 4, with your wisdom and your understanding, you've gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. You set your heart as the heart of a god, and skipping to verse... Uh, Verse 11, the verses we normally use. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. And then it says that you were the anointed cherub who covers. And there are multiple references now in these few verses that imply you were in the immediate presence of God. It's so easy for us to forget the fact. We kind of get... We kind of superimpose our view of things today and forget where things started. This was not like people who have always hated each other from eternity past. We've always hated each other, never liked you, don't want to like you. That's not what happened here. What happened in heaven was a domestic dispute, guys. This was a family affair and is heartbreaking and devastating to God the Father, to Jesus the Son, to the Spirit, and to the loyal angels. Maybe some of you are acquainted with this. There's been a mutiny in your own family. People have left, unkind things have been said, and they're still justifying themselves. You've got a God in heaven who knows what that feels like. You have a Father in heaven who's acquainted with this type of dispute, and he knows how much it hurts. If you're feeling that right now, you've lost people in your family that you wish would come back, God knows exactly what that is like. And he can comfort you in ways that nobody else can. Amen? But it says that you were the anointed cherub of covers. You were in the midst of the, four, uh, the fiery stones as the pavement before God's throne. And you were on the holy mountain of God. God many times revealed himself on mountains. So what's implied here is you were in the presence of God. You were in the presence of God. You were in the presence of God. And it's a bit of a chiasm, but it's not fully in line. Uh, some letters rearrange themselves, but it's a similar idea that three points are made. And then there's a statement of contrast. You were perfect in the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. And that's the point. That's kind of the apex of this text. And then it says, because iniquity was found in you, you were no longer the cherub. You were destroyed as the covering cherub. Verse, yeah, 16. I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. I destroyed you a covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stone. So you were in the presence of God, in the presence of God, in the presence of God. You were perfect, but iniquity was found in you. The point in transition is now you were removed from the presence of God. Removed from the presence of God. Removed from the presence of God. And it says that the iniquity of his trading is used twice in Ezekiel chapter 28. And that word for trading here is the word rekula. It's basically trafficking or gossiping. It was merchandising. Right? He was selling things about the character of God that led to this troubling situation. And we're familiar with Isaiah chapter 14. I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will exalt all so forth. All these upward words. He had upward ambitions. But it's very interesting because there are five, there are actually 11 upward words that are used in Isaiah chapter 14. But he, he wants to go up, 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 up at the expense of everyone else. But in the end, he's going to be cast down and destroyed, we're told. But you see this in contrast to Jesus, who in Philippians chapter 2 humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Jesus comes down, down, down for the uplifting of everyone else. And in turn, every knee will bow and declare that Jesus Christ is righteous, holy, just, and good. The two sides of the great controversy are very clear. One is operating under the premises of selfishness, and the other is operating under other-centered love. This is the battlefield. This is the way the great controversy is being played out. And a spirit of selfishness, self-exaltation, pride, envy, and striving for advancement is a spirit that originates with Lucifer and self-justification, if I didn't put that in there. This cannot be the spirit that rules the people of God, and we desperately need Jesus and his spirit of humility, gentleness, unselfishness, and a willingness to be overlooked and unappreciated. We need to have that same spirit. But I want to close uh, with an idea here as far as our last text and make some brief points. What was heaven's reaction to the spirit that overtook Lucifer and the subsequent actions that he took? One of my favorite verses is in Luke chapter 10. So Jesus sends the 70 missionaries out to go preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons. 
and they come back and they are excited. They are stoked and they're snapping their suspenders and say, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And you would think that maybe Jesus would be excited about this. Way to go, fellas. But the response of Jesus is so unexpected and seemingly odd if you don't understand the whole background that we've been covering this morning. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What does that have to do with anything, Jesus? Everything, actually. When this rebellion happened, I was there. I watched my family self-destruct before my very eyes. And it still grieves me. And these demons that you're casting out weren't always demons. They were my family. They were my children. I created them. And I think this is super important for us to grasp. We completely divorce God's heart when we discuss this topic. Satan's such a bad guy. And he is. He is full of vileness. But let's not negate the fact that when you have a family that you create in love, just because they're doing things that you hate, it's very difficult for you to still hate them. Are you with me? Your kids may do things that you hate right now, but you don't hate them. And there's a line of distinction that I think is drawn here and, and, and a peek behind the veil into the heart of God that's very important for us. And I'm saying he's sympathizing with Satan or any of that. He has made a final decision that he will be judged firmly but you cannot negate the fact that it's one of your kids. They don't stop being your kids when bad things happen. Are you understanding? And so he says, look, I've given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. What he's saying here is don't rejoice over the fact that they aren't going. That still pains me. I don't want to think about that right now. Just be glad that you are going. And you're also exhibiting some traces of the spirit of Lucifer. You're boasting over your power and authority over someone that you overcame. And I'm not boasting. This is a strange act for me. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked or the source of wickedness, but I got to do it. Are you with me today, guys? We lose sight of the fact that Revelation 12 was a domestic dispute, a family affair. Love and harmony preceded this dispute. And that love in the heart of the Father and Christ does not go away just because someone in the family has turned on them. And there's a really important lesson for you and me today. This tells me that when I reflect the spirit of Lucifer and strive for supremacy or put myself first or become envious of my neighbor, that Jesus and the Father don't stop loving me either. Now, there's one more bit of history here that I think is very fascinating. The book of Job was written first of all the books we had in the Bible. And the first theme that's introduced in the book of Job is this battlefield of selfishness and unselfishness. It's the first thing that's discussed. Lucifer comes before the, the, the gathering here, Satan comes before the gathering, and he's asked, where did you come from? And he says, from walking to and fro on the earth, which is declaring, that's my dominion. And the response is given to him is, not everyone listens to you. What about Job? And the response he's given is, rubbish. He's only following you because you are blessing him. You're selfish, and so you favor him because you need worship. And he's selfish. He gives you good things because he doesn't want to get in trouble. So Satan declares that God is selfish and that his followers are selfish. And it happens twice. And this is super important. The first lesson that was given to us in any written inspired words is the battlefield that you and I are on today. Yes, there's a war that started in heaven, but it ain't over, folks. It's still going on, and it's over this issue. Selfishness and other-centered love. And the question is, how are we going to choose to do life? God's not threatened by these accusations, by the way. He's never threatened. Why? Because he's fully secure in who he is. You want to know why we get so easily offended? It's our insecurity. 
Jesus was never insecure. Jesus knew who he was. You can call me fat. You can call me ugly. You can call me dumb. You can call me a Nazarene. You can call me whatever you want. Somebody from Nazareth. Can any good, anything good come from Nazareth? It doesn't matter what you call me because my self-worth is not based upon what you think of me. My self-worth is fully anchored in knowing that I am loved and accepted by God. And anything that happens horizontally can't touch that. And this is the reason that Jesus is wanting that same security to be in yours experience and in mine. Right in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, that we may know and believe the love that God has for us. Not just intellectually agree that it's plausible. God wants us to experientially know that love and to live our lives as if we believed it. That's what he wants. And that's why the most precious message is so powerful, because it makes that point so clear to the world. If you haven't read Ron's book, The Return of the Latter Rain, Volume 1, read the chapters on the 1889 revivals. It's two chapters. And when you read through this, you recognize the freedom and healing that people found and the security that they found was in direct result to hearing the message of God's agape love, even for the lost for the depraved, for those who can't seem to get anything right. And this is what gives the intrinsic motivation. When you encounter the faith of Jesus, it awakens a reciprocating faith in Jesus to live a life that would honor that type of belief. We have to believe what God says about us. That's where our security and healing is found. So the first book that God recorded for humanity gives us that big picture of this conflict between good and evil, unselfish love and selfishness. And this is the territory on which the great controversy is fought. Every act of obedience or disobedience and every act of worship are birthed out of these two principles. Every one of them. So we're told this, the law that none liveth to himself, Satan was determined to oppose. He desired to live for self, and it was this that incited rebellion in heaven. And it was man's acceptance of this principle that brought sin upon the earth. Education. Unselfishness, the principle of God's kingdom, is the principle that Satan hates. Its very existence he denies. From the beginning of the great controversy, Satan has endeavored to prove God's principles of action to be selfish. And he deals in the same way with all who serve God. You're selfish. And we saw that illusion in Job. To disprove Satan's claim is the work of Christ and of all who bear his name. So we don't get a pass in this. You see that? The true call of a Christian, of a disciple of Jesus, is to live a life that is outward focused. This is for the uplifting and upbuilding of those around us. It was to give in his own life, speaking of Jesus, an illustration of unselfishness that Jesus came in the form of humanity. He lived a perfectly unselfish life in human flesh, not to show off, but to now give you access to that same type of life through the outpouring of the Spirit. Amen? That's true righteousness by faith. And all who accept this principle are to be workers together with him in demonstrating it in the practical life. That's your call, parents. (laughs) at your call, spouses, and all of us, right? To, to plead with God for the humility of Christ, the othered-centered, agape love of Jesus. So from the very beginning of the rebellion, Satan has sought to portray God as being selfish, while at the same time alluring others to live for themselves and abide by his kingdom principle. And that campaign is still alive and well today, unfortunately. It ain't over yet, folks. But the good news is that the war has been won by a completely different approach and worldview. Going back to 1 Corinthians 13, God suffers long and is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. He's not puffed up. He does not behave rudely. He does not seek his own, is not provoked. Don't these verses take a totally different meaning after reading what happened in heaven? Not easily provoked is long-suffering thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This is the way that things began. God is love. And the very fact that love focuses on others implies that there have to have been others to show that love to. So here's the good news, beloved. Agape wins. Amen. Let's pray. 
God in heaven, I thank you for loving us so much. I thank you that you even loved those who have started this whole scenario. You're not showing sympathy. You're not enabling. But Lord, you truly have a fountain of love that has never run dry. Even in the face of anger, of lies, of accusation, of betrayal, of projection, of foolishness. And yet you just keep loving. Jesus, you said in John chapter 14, I believe, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And in John chapter 13, verse 1, we're told that Jesus came into the world and he loved us to the end. That having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And Lord, you're going to love Lucifer to the end when he's fully destroyed. You're going to love me to the end wherever I find myself. But I want to be in that city. I believe that's the same for all of us who are here today. And Lord, I pray that you would sweep us off our feet, that we would know and believe the love that God has for us, and that that would empower us to live a life that's no longer insecure and selfish, but one that is confident, courageous, and winsome. This is our prayer today, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.